Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see everyone out this morning. Good to see your smiling faces. Uh, lovely to see so many out, and trust God will bless us this morning as we come to worship Him. If you're visiting with us, we give you an extra special word of welcome. Whether you're visiting in person or online, we thank you so much for joining with us this morning. Trust that God will bless us all as we've come to worship Him today. We're going to begin our time this morning by singing together a great, great hymn of praise. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory. Thy or death hast won. Now, this is one of these ones. I know I say this all the time. This is one of these ones you have to sing out, but it's a fantastic piece. It's a, it's a great hymn of praise, and we surely can't sing it with frowns in our faces. We'll have, to sh- we'll have to show the Lord that we're enjoying this, and show the other people that we enjoy being saved, and we enjoy the Lord who has saved us. So really, let's sing it out the best we can to the praise of our God this morning. the Lord. That was great singing. Thank you so much for that. Well, we're going to come before the Lord, and we're going to seek His help and His blessing on our gathering here this morning. It's good to see back with us again our brother George, who's been off for a little while with sickness, and it's great to see him back with us again. I trust the Lord will continue to bless him and help him as he recovers. Uh, but uh, great to have all here, and we just tr- trust that God will bless us this morning. Uh, there's, I just heard this morning of Uh, We've heard recently of one man who's given his life to the Lord, and this morning we're just told of two others as well that have got saved in recent days. We'll give you those details on Tuesday evening, Uh, but we praise the Lord for that. We give him all the glory, and we thank him for continuing to work and to save souls in these days. But let's just come before the Lord just now and seek his blessing. 
Heavenly Father, we repeat those words that we've been singing. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou or death hast won. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that whenever you conquered death through the resurrection of thy Son, we thank thee, Father, that not only was death defeated, but sin was defeated, suffering was defeated, and Satan was defeated. And we praise you, Heavenly Father, that today we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Heavenly Father, we can look forward to that moment when we close our eyes in this world and open them in glory, and we see our Savior face to face. For, Lord, those of us that have trusted in Christ can say this morning that we're saved by the grace of God, and heaven is our final home. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Thee that You have gathered us into this place this morning to praise Your name to give you worship and thanksgiving, to glorify thy name and to exalt it high. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that our praise and our worship would be acceptable to thee today. Father, in this past week, we have had to deal with the, the various occasions of life, those things that come upon us day by day. Father, very often they have distracted us. And Lord, we, we, we know, Lord, that each and every day we have sinned against thee in word, thought, or deed. But Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that whenever we come back to Thee once again, confessing those daily sins, we receive that forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not that we're saved again, but we can enjoy that fellowship once again in our Savior. And we praise You for that and pray, dear God, that we would enjoy that fellowship greatly this morning. You have promised, Father, that where two or three are gathered together in Thy name, You're there in the midst. And so, Father, we know that you're present here today. And we know, Father, that, you've, that you're in this place uh, to bless us. We know that the Holy Spirit of God is here to instruct us and to teach us in the things of God. So as we open the Scriptures today, we pray, Heavenly Father, that thy Spirit would teach us, that he would give us understanding of these great spiritual truths, that he would apply them to each and every heart. And, Father, that we would all leave knowing that thy voice has been speaking into our hearts today. Father, we thank Thee for the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that it would always be precious to us, and Lord, that we this morning might be blessed by it. Father, we thank You too for our boys and girls, for all that they've been learning already today in Sunday school, for all that they will learn very shortly as we think once again of George Muller. Lord, we thank You for the lessons that we can learn from the lives of Thy saints, and we pray, Lord, that as we again look at this wonderful life, Lord, we pray that we would learn not just from the wonderful things that you have done through him, but even through his mistakes, Father, that we would learn that, that you're a merciful and a gracious God, a God who continues to use those that are imperfect. And so, Father, we thank thee that our boys and girls uh, are learning these lessons. And we pray, Lord, that if they're not already saved, that they would put their trust in thee early in life. And if they are, Father, that they would grow to be great men and women of God who trust thee and pray to thee and trust Thee for all things. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that this is all possible because of Christ. And we thank Thee for Thy great love toward us, that love which commendeth unto us Thine only begotten Son, crucified, slain for us in Calvary, and risen again from the dead. Thy Word tells us that You've commanded Thy love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, what a wonderful love You've shown to us. And we pray, Father, that as we consider him this morning in the breaking of the bread, Lord, that those moments would be once again precious to us as we see all that he had to endure and even just a glimpse of it, of what he had to endure when he went to Calvary for us. So, Lord, we do thank thee for these wonderful truths. We thank thee for these blessings that we enjoy today, for the privilege we have of gathering. And yet, Lord, we remember those who can't be with us today. We pray your blessing upon those that are ill, those for, for whom age has caught up with them, and they can't be in our midst this morning. And we pray, Lord, that even in their own homes, they would know a sense of Thy presence with them, that You would draw graciously near to them and give them that grace for each and every day. We thank, Lord, of those that are far from us for other reasons. We thank of Katie in America, Johanna in Cardiff. And Lord, we pray that they would know Thy blessing as well, as they would seek to have fellowship with God's people. Lord, may they know Thy presence with them also today. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for salvation. We praise you, Lord, for these souls that we have heard of in recent days that have given their lives to the Savior. Lord, may they know great peace and joy in believing. 
Father, may you give them great boldness to share with others the great things you've done in their lives. And Lord, we pray that they would bear great testimony to the changing and saving faith of Christ. Lord, we pray for others as well. We all have family members that are far from thee. And Lord, we pray that you would speak into their hearts even today, whether it's through our own meetings or elsewhere or through some personal contact or something that they've heard over the years. Bring it into their mind, Father, and bring them under that conviction of sin and save their precious souls, we pray. We know that thou canst do it. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be merciful and gracious unto them. So, Lord, we ask for your help and for your blessing. We pray that all that we would seek to do would bring honor and glory unto thee. And we pray, Father, that in all things our Savior might be honored and lifted up. For it's in his name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we're going to sing a song for you just now. And as we come towards the end of it, if you want to come up to the front, and we'll learn a bit more about George Miller. But we're going to sing, Thou art a wonderful God. Thou art a wonderful God. Thou madest the mountains, thou madest the sea, thou madest the songbirds that fly over me. Thou art a wonderful God. Let's stand together to sing. Well, good morning, boys and girls. All well? Yeah, that's great, great. Good to see you all this morning. And uh, we're learning about who? George Muller. That's right. And you're even shouting it out, which is great. Uh, you know it so well now. Well, I want to tell you about another man just very, very quickly. There was a man who was called Willie Sutton. And years and years and years ago, Willie Sutton was a well-known bank robber. And whenever he got caught, somebody said to him, why did you rob so many banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Well, George Muller, remember before he got saved, before he became a Christian, he stole money from his friends. That was the old George. But the new George was very different. The new George wanted to live for God. And now George Muller needed money, and he needed it for food, for fees, for books, and for rent. He needed somewhere to live, so he needed the rent. He needed to eat, so he needed the food. He needed the books and the fees for his studies at university. And he had no money. But remember last time we left him, he was on his knees. He was praying to God. He was asking God to meet his needs. Well, God knew all about George's needs. And God knows about all of our needs because God knows everything about us. He knows every word, every thought, every action, all the things we think, say, and do. God knows it all. Now, I wonder how that makes you feel. You think over the last day or two. Think about the things that you've thought, things that you've said, things that you've done. I wonder, is God happy with everything? I think none of us could really say that God's happy with everything that we've done, because we all sin every single day. 
But God still loves us, and He still wants, wants to forgive us. And as long as we come to Him and ask Him to forgive us, He will do that so that we can continue to enjoy Him and work for Him. Well, George told God about his need for the money. I wonder, was, was God able to give George what he needed? Well, the next morning, there was a knock at his door. And one of his teachers was there from the university, and he had with him a man called Dr. Charles Hodge. Now, Dr. Hodge wasn't German. He was American. And he was an American professor who was visiting Germany. And he came, he was looking for someone who was good with English that could teach him the German language. And George was the perfect person because he knew these languages really, really well. Obviously, he knew German because that's what he was brought up with, but he had learned English and he spoke it very, very well. And of course, he had learned a couple of other languages as well. George says, but I, I don't think I can. I need to get money for my fees and everything else. I, I'm going out looking for a job. I need to earn money to pay all these things. And Dr. Hodge says to him, I'll pay you double for eight hours every week to teach me German. And George did a quick calculation in his head. Remember, he was very good with numbers. He had a quick calculation in his head. He says, well, that will get me about a quarter of what I need. I really need four people to do that. And he's thinking this in his head. And then Dr. Hodge says, and by the way, there's three other men that want to learn German as well, and they'll pay the same for eight hours a week. So now he doesn't have one person giving him just a quarter of what he needs. He has four men who are willing to give him everything that he needs. God has answered his prayer immediately, just the very next morning. God answered George's prayer. And here now he was teaching Dr. Hodge and his three friends how to speak German. And they're paying him, and that's all that he needed. But you know, God did even something better than that. Because not only did, George, did God provide George with everything that he needed in his money, he also provided him somewhere to live that didn't cost him anything. So he actually got to live in a room in the local orphanage, and he was able to stay there without having to pay any rent, and God made sure that George had everything that he needed, but God was still working. There's a reason why God gave George a, a home in the orphanage, but we'll come to that some other time. If you love Jesus and you've asked him to be your Savior, God hears your prayers too. You know, on Friday night, the minibus went out to pick up the boys and girls for Kids Zone, and it got filled. The bus was filled, 14 kids in the bus. And Heather was so excited, and she was talking to Johanna, and said to Johanna, you know, there was, the bus was absolutely filled tonight. And Johanna says, I knew it was going to be filled, because I've been praying for that all week. God answers prayer. And there's another prayer that was answered for us even just last week. Because God loves us and He wants us to work for Him. And when we do, He will hear and He will answer our prayers. He doesn't always answer the way we want them to, but He always answers the best way. Well, George then started asking God for something else, to show Him where He wanted Him to go to serve Him. And one of his lectures was a man called Dr. Tholuck, which is a very strange name to us, but I'm sure it isn't in Germany. Dr. Tholuck. And Dr. Tholuck said to George, you know, I really feel that you need to go to England, to London, and to work with the Jewish people that live in London. And George wasn't really interested in going to London. He, he thought that he was going to serve God maybe in Germany or maybe somewhere else, but he then thought about the promise that he had made to God, that he would do whatever God told him to do. And he says, well, okay, send them my details and we'll see what happens. So they were all sent away to the London Society for Jews and nothing seemed to happen. And he waited three months and then eventually he got a letter back from the London Society of Jews. And what do you think the letter said? What do you think it said? Any ideas? Um, we need to know more about you. It didn't say, come on over and help us. It didn't say, no, we're not interested. Nothing like that. It says, we need to more, know more about you. And George, he was so frustrated. He says, why can't they not just tell me to come? But he wrote down what they needed anyway, and he sent it off, and nothing seemed to happen for three months. 
And at the end of three months, he got another letter from the London Society of Jews. And this letter says, yes, we want you to come and work with us for six months as a trial. And George was furious. He said, why can they not just let me come and work with them? Can they not see that I love God? Can they not see that I want to do something for Him? Why do I have to just go for a trial? Why can I not just go and work with them? But you see, that wasn't God's plan for George. He wanted George to go and learn things for those six months. But he calmed down then, and he agreed to go because he believed that this is where God wanted him to go. Remember that God's ways are always best, and they're not always the ways that we want. They may not always fit in with our plans, but God's ways are always best. And He always wants us to do what He says, even if we don't like the idea. And whatever He asks us to do, God will never, ever let us down, and He'll never leave us. Well, in order to go to London, George needed a passport. And this passport business was a bit difficult because he sent off an application, and it got rejected for some reason. And he sent it off again, and it got rejected. Four times he sent off an application for a passport, and every time it got rejected. He was so frustrated. He was absolutely sure now that God wanted him to go to London to reach the Jewish people. So he didn't give up. But you see, sometimes whenever we try to do what God says, the devil doesn't like it. And sometimes the devil will try to stop us, and he'll make things awkward, and he'll maybe use other people to try to stop us from doing what God says. But we need to remember that God is so much bigger and stronger than the devil. The devil's powerful, and he's more powerful than we are, but God is all-powerful, and nothing can stop God's will from being done. And so, George trusted God. Well, as a young German man, at that time in Germany, all young German men had to spend some time in the army. And George's name was called up, and George had to go and see if he was going to be in the army. And he was thinking, is this going to stop me from going to London? But George had a little bit of a problem. He wasn't a very well young man. His health wasn't great. In fact, he had a really, 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 really bad cough, and it was so bad that he actually burst a blood vessel in his stomach, and it was very, very painful. But because of that, when the army was talking to him, and when they were questioning him and testing him for medical condition and all the rest of it, they found out he actually wasn't well enough to be a soldier. So they let him not join the army. George didn't have to go and join the army for a period of time. He was free to go to London if only he could get the passport. But as soon as all this happened with the army, all of a sudden his next application for a passport went through without any problems, and he got his passport. And he was so excited because now he was ready to go to London, and he was ready to do God's work with the Jewish people. God even used his sickness as a way of getting George to do what God wanted him to do. And sometimes, boys and girls, whenever bad things happen to us, we sometimes wonder, why is God letting this happen to me? Well, He has a very good reason for it every time. And we just have to trust Him that He knows what He's doing and that He's only doing what's best for us and for Him and for His glory and for His work. I wonder what's going to happen to George in London. I wonder, is he going to get to do this work that God has called him to do? Is he going to be able to reach the Jews? How is going to God going to use him? And is he going to be healthy enough to do all this work? Well, you're going to have to wait until next week to find out. All right. Thank you for listening so well. Let's have a wee word of prayer. All right. And then you can head back to your seats. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is great and mighty and powerful. You're the God who hears and answers prayer. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're the God who is able to take even the sad and the difficult and the hurtful things that we have to go through and make them into something wonderful and good. We pray, Father, that every boy and girl would trust you 
If they haven't trusted you to save them, that you would save their soul. If they have trusted you to save them, that they would trust you to lead them into the right thing that you want them to do and help them to obey that, knowing that your way is always best and you will never leave them and you'll never forsake them. Thank you for every boy and girl that's here. We love every one of them because of the Lord Jesus and pray, Lord, that they would love him as well. We ask you to bless each one in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much, boys and girls. You head back to your seats. I'm going to call on Michael now to come and bring the announcements. Thank you. It's great to hear that story. Don't know about the children. Enjoying it. I think everybody else in the church is enjoying that story. Thanks very much, brother, for that story. Well, after this morning's service will be the Lord's table. All who are walking in fellowship with the Lord are invited to stay and remember him in his own appointed way. All women are requested to have their heads covered in accordance with the scriptural pattern. Our speaker today, as you see, is our own pastor, David Cosby. And then at this evening service, Heavenly Sunshine will bring a message in song. Also, Mike McClellan will give his testimony. So please, if you can, come back again tonight. Fill this place and people will hear testimony. A testimony that everybody in this church should have and be gloriously honoured to give. Then on Tuesday at 8 p.m. is the prayer and Bible study with her again with her own pastor, David. On Friday night's Kids Zone at 6.30 and also the Youth Fellowship. Then Saturday morning, at 9.30 is the men's breakfast. Joshua Truesdale will bring a message from the Lord. Please, men, come along if you can at half nine. It's always a great time. It's always a great feed. It's always a great fellowship to have together. The Sunday school next Sunday will be on at 10.15 a.m. And then next Lord's Day, our own pastor will speak at both services, a.m. and p.m. A time of prayer precedes both of these services at 11 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. in the room at the back. And please remember the missions we support from the church, especially your own brother Stephen working with Shining Lights. And remember all those who are led aside at this time, we'll bring them before the Lord and ask the Lord to bless them, uphold them and heal them. Now all these announcements are made in the will of the Lord. And I'd like to thank everybody that prayed for me, phoned me and sent me texts when I was off with my sickness, as you call it. But thank you very much everybody for your concern. Thank you again. Thank you, Michael. I think Stephen's glad that you're up doing the announcements again as well. <laughs> well. Thank you so much. Now we're going to sing again before we turn to God's Word. And we're singing a beautiful hymn, Loved with everlasting love, led by grace, that love to know, spirit breathing from above, thou hast taught me it is so. Let's stand together, please, before we come to the Word of God.
Now, would you turn your Bibles, please, this morning to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We'd encourage you to come along this evening and bring others with you if you can as well, as Mike would come and bring his testimony. As I said before, Mike comes from a Roman Catholic background and be telling us a little bit about what he experienced in that religion, uh, but how the Lord delivered him from it as well and saved his soul. So, we encourage you to come along. The young people will be leading the chorus singing again at the beginning of that service. And of course, we've got Heavenly Sunshine, so it's quite a packed program we have for tonight, Uh, but we think you'll enjoy it, and we trust that God will move, and that He will speak to hearts and save souls this evening. Ephesians chapter 3 then, and beginning to read at verse 14, and we're going to read down uh, to verse 21. Paul says, "'For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ,' of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge." that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen and amen. Our text, of course, is 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. And in verse 13, Uh, We have seen three aspects of the vision that we're looking at as a church. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. And we come to the fourth one this morning, be strong. When Jimmy was racing, when Jimmy is racing, (laughs) every car he drives needs to be reinforced for safety. So someone made the car frame stronger by installing a roll cage in it. I'm sure there's other things there that I know nothing about. So when the car overturned, Jimmy and his navigator would be protected. And I know Jimmy was glad for the strength of that roll cage. When Tim was preparing for a marathon, it's great whenever you use somebody's name in the service. (laughs) He's just shocked. (laughs) But when Tim was preparing for the marathon, He had to train his body to make it strong so that it would be able to endure the race for the whole thing, and he'd be able to complete the race. He had to strengthen himself. Those are two examples of something being made strong. Someone made the rally car strong by installing a roll cage. Tim made himself strong by training, but neither of those describe the type of being strong that we see in 1 Corinthians 16. Paul isn't instructing us to make something else or someone else strong. He's not instructing us to make ourselves strong. He's telling us to let ourselves be made strong. That's the sense of that phrase, be strong. It's to let ourselves be made strong. It's more like someone who's been in a coma for a year. They have no strength in themselves. Their muscles have begun to waste. They don't have the ability to strengthen themselves. And so a physiotherapist comes into them, and they manipulate their limbs. They work their muscles so that they can regain strength. The patient is being made strong by someone else. That's what Paul is telling us to do. Be strong by letting yourself be made strong. This word appears four times in the New Testament, and in every case it carries that same meaning, that passive voice, we call it, describing someone being made strong. It's used of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 and verse 80, where it says of him, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. He waxed strong in spirit. He was made strong in spirit. It's used again almost word for word, but this time of the Lord Jesus as a child. It says concerning Him, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon Him. We then see it in our text in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, 
And then the final time that we see it is in our other reading in Ephesians chapter 3, and it's in verse 16, where it says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. In every case, even in the case of the Lord's early childhood, the strength comes from an outside source. So, in order for us to be strong, to be steadfast, to endure, we need to humble ourselves to receive and to depend on the strength that comes not from ourselves, but from the Holy Spirit. And so, we're considering this morning how we need to trust and be humble so that we can be strong. First, I want you to see that strength comes from maturity. Turn back into Luke chapter 2 just to see that verse again. Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And when we think of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, this kind of a verse is a remarkable, mysterious verse. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Whenever we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, we wouldn't usually think of him needing grace because He is the source of grace. We wouldn't think of Him needing strength because He is the source of might and power. We wouldn't think of Him needing knowledge or wisdom because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, when we think of Him as a child growing up, when we think of His humanity, He had to grow in all of these things, including in spirit which is a very strange thing to think about. The focus here on the strength is strength in the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit is that part of us that relates to and interacts with spiritual things, and it's especially that part that is the source or is is the focal point of our relationship with God. It's that part that died in Adam and Eve the day they took that fruit off the tree that they shouldn't have taken. It's that part in us that's given new life when we then trust in Christ as Savior. And like every living thing, our spirit needs to grow and it needs to become strong. Now, as I said, it seems strange to think of the Spirit of the Lord growing strong because He is God and God is Spirit. How can the Spirit of God be anything less than strong? And yet, that's exactly what this verse tells us. He waxed strong. He grew strong in spirit. He increased his strength in his spirit. This is the the great mystery of the incarnation. This is one of those things that we accept, but we can't understand, not entirely. That God come in flesh so veiled his deity and so veiled his glory that even his spirit had to grow strong. Now, that's not to say that he was ever vulnerable to sin. He wasn't. At all times, from the very moment he was given a body in Mary's womb, he was sinless, he was perfect. It was impossible for the Lord Jesus Christ to sin. So, how did the Lord's Spirit grow strong? Remember, the Spirit is that part that governs our relationship with God. And as the child Christ grew in age as a human, so did his relationship with God the Father. He became more and more aware of God the Father in his life. His relationship between him as a human and his Father in heaven strengthened his awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit working in him and working through him. That developed and it grew stronger as time went on. Even at age 12, he had developed by that stage a great awareness of the Father's will. But he grew into that awareness. And as he grew through childhood, he had to be taught the Scriptures and had to learn to read. Imagine that. The Lord who created man's mouth, the Lord who confused the languages of mankind at Babel, 
The Lord who spoke to Moses from a cloud of thunder at Mount Sinai and gave him the law of God had to learn to read when he became human. Such was his humility and the mystery of God in flesh. But this waxing strong in spirit isn't something that automatically happens to us. It's something that we need to surrender to. You see, we have things in our life that get in the way of our spiritual growth. We have lusts and desires that conceive to bring forth sin, and that sin hinders our relationship with the Lord. It stunts our spiritual growth. We have plans and ambitions that don't always match up to God's will, and they may cause us to resist what He's trying to do in us. We have cares and trials. We have distractions and entertainments that shift our attention away from the Lord and slow our spiritual growth. And we have a stubbornness within us that comes from our old nature that sometimes just doesn't want to be shifted and doesn't want to be changed as is needed in order for us to grow in the Lord. God wants us to grow in the Spirit, but these are obstacles to that growth. He wants our relationship with Him to strengthen and to flourish so that He can do great things with us and wonderful things through us. The reason the Lord was so consistent in His growing spiritual strength was because He was fully and perfectly controlled by the Holy Spirit, fully and perfectly submissive to the Father's will and to the work of the Holy Spirit through him. Even John the Baptist grew in spirit because he was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. That's another mysterious thing. But so much so that the Lord Jesus himself said that there was none greater than John the Baptist that was born of a woman. And so this spiritual maturity comes from being filled with the Spirit. Now, this is something that we mentioned briefly with the young adults group last night. In Ephesians 5 and verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul is contrasting and comparing being filled with wine to being filled with the Spirit. Someone who's filled with alcohol takes on the character of alcohol, which Paul says is in excess. He says, wherein is excess. What does that mean? It means that a person who's filled with alcohol isn't moderate. They're not controlled. They are excessively violent, or they're excessively foolish, or they're excessively affectionate. They go to extremes when they're under the control of the alcohol. But someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit takes on the character of the Holy Spirit. That's seen in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That comes out of the person who's filled with the Spirit of God. Just as the character of alcohol comes out of somebody who's filled with alcohol, so the character of the Spirit comes out with someone who's filled with the Spirit. So in order for us to mature in our spirit, we need to surrender to the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's not getting more of the Spirit, it's the Spirit getting more of us. Us letting go of our carnal tendencies so that He may give us spiritual character instead. And it's that spiritual maturity that will make us strong. But how does that spiritual growth happen? Secondly, spiritual strength comes from spirituality. Look again at Ephesians 3 and 16. Ephesians 3 and 16. The end of the verse says, "...to be strengthened with His might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, how the Spirit strengthens us is seen in the surrounding verses. Look, first of all, again at this verse. The Spirit strengthens us mightily because it says here, strengthened with might by His Spirit. He he strengthens us mightily. Look at verse 20. Now, unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power of that worketh in us. This is a work that involves the power of the Almighty. Now, that tells us something of how difficult it is for us to be strong. If it takes the power and the might of the Almighty God 
to make us spiritually strong, then it's impossible for us to make ourselves strong. We must depend on God if we're going to be strong. We need to surrender to God's power so that we can become strong. We need to count ourselves as weak and powerless so that we can be made strong. Now, that reminds me of something else that Paul wrote. Turn back into 2 Corinthians, please, in chapter 12. 2 Corinthians and chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Paul says, "...and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness." Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. There's only two kinds of power that we possess, physical and mental. Now, the mental power, the mental strength that we have includes things like emotion and intellect and our will. And we can be strong in those things, but that's all part of our mental strength. But those are natural powers. Those are things that we have been born with. They come from our body. They come from our soul. Those are the two parts of us that were alive from conception. When we think about the power that we need for spiritual strength, it's a power we didn't have before we were saved because our spirit was dead. And the life that we now have isn't our own. It's the life of Christ. Paul said that in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Our spiritual life is Christ living in me. And so our power is useless. Our own natural power, our natural strength is useless for making that spiritual part of us strong. And when we realize that, we get to the place where Paul is at in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says in verse 10 that he takes pleasure in all of these things that make him weak, physically, even mentally, because when I am weak, then am I strong. When Paul is weak, then he depends on God. Then he relies on God. How many times have you been asked to do something for the Lord or you've taken on something to do for the Lord and you feel so incapable of doing it? And you feel that it's far too much for you, yet it's, you know that the Lord has led you into it. Well, folks, when you're weak, then you're strong. That's when you rely on God. That's when you turn to God to give you the strength to do it. And when you rely fully upon the Lord to give you that strength, He will enable you beyond your natural capacity. He'll give you that supernatural strength to do what you can't do in your own strength. Romans 8 really hammers this home, hammers home this futility of relying on our own strength and power and instead to rely on the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1 to begin with, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 7, 
because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Why? Because the carnal mind is natural. The law of God is supernatural. It's spiritual. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But look at verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see the importance of relying on the Spirit to give us that strength. But the might of the Spirit is the only power we can have that will strengthen our own spirit. The Spirit strengthens us mightily, but the Spirit strengthens us lovingly. Again in Ephesians 3, verse 17, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. He says in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Folks, once we begin to grasp the truth that God's love for us is infinite and it's unconditional and it's unchanging, when we grasp that truth, then we can begin to trust Him. Imagine a small child on a climbing frame, and they've climbed higher than they really should have, and whenever they look down, they get scared and they cry out for help. Now, a stranger may come along with good intentions and tell them to jump, and he'll catch them. But the child doesn't know the stranger. He has no relationship with the stranger, so they don't trust them. They don't jump. But then the father comes along, and this is, this is the one who gives them hugs. He, this is the one who kisses them good night. This is the one throughout their short life that has done the, his best to protect them and to care for them. And he comes to the climbing frame. He says the same thing, jump and I'll catch you. Now, jumping, that doesn't usually make sense to the child. Jumping means falling and falling means pain. But because the child knows their daddy, because they know that the love that he has for them, the child jumps and is caught and is safe. What makes the difference? the child knowing the love of the Father. And so it is between us and our Heavenly Father. When we understand the love that He has for us, when He tells us to do something that in other circumstances we wouldn't even consider because to us it just doesn't make sense, we'll do it anyway because we know our Father loves us and He'll catch us. Even when circumstances cause us to fear, when troubles come into our lives, which they will, when we appreciate the love of our Father for us, we'll face that trouble with hope and with faith because we know our God is with us in the trial and He'll catch us. He's allowed it to come for a reason. And we know that that reason must be good and it must be for our benefit and for His glory and maybe for the benefit of someone else as well. And so we endure the trial because we know the love of God. It's it's the knowledge of His love for us that gives us that strength to endure and to keep going. That's how His love makes us strong. That's why Paul says that his desire is that these believers would know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. The Spirit strengthens us mightily and lovingly, but He also strengthens us generously. Because again in verse 16, He says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory. Verse 19 says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20 says about Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. These all speak of the generosity of God in giving us strength abundantly without skimping on it. You remember whenever the Lord was going with Jairus to heal Jairus' daughter, and eventually, as things transpired to raise her from the dead, the woman with the issue of blood came in the crowd, and she just touched the hem of his garment and was instantly healed. Do you remember what the Lord said? 
He said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me, that strength, that power is gone out of me. Jesus wasn't saying that the strength had left him and now he was lacking that strength. He wasn't saying that it was something that he was now missing, that it was taken from him. He was merely stating that some of his infinite strength had transferred from him to another. He wasn't scolding. He, was, he, he had just as much infinite strength as he had before, but the woman had benefited from some of that strength. And so the Lord tenderly comes to her, and it's the only time that He approaches an individual and calls them daughter that we find recorded in Scripture. Such is the tenderness that He approaches her with. And He says to her, Be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace. He didn't begrudge her receiving any of His power. He didn't resent it, saying, how dare you take it without asking? He was glad for her to receive it. The Lord is generous with His power. He's generous with His blessings. He will never withhold any good thing that we need from us. <coughs> In James 1 and verse 5, it says, if, you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Doesn't, he doesn't chastise us. He doesn't chide us or, or give off to us about it. He gives liberally. And it says, and it shall be given him. Such is the generosity of our God. So our strength comes from the Holy Spirit. But like that desperate woman, we need to receive it by faith receiving it as a gift from the one who is so mighty and so loving and so generous in His giving. But finally, strength comes from maturity and from spirituality, but strength comes from humility. Our text in 1 Corinthians 16 says, be strong. Of the five aspects to this vision that we're looking at, this is the only one that is passive. Think back to those three illustrations at the start. The mechanic gave strength to the car by installing the roll cage. I don't know whether he's called a mechanic or not, but I'll call him that. The mechanic was active in strengthening. He gave strength to something else. Tim strengthened himself. He did the training. That's what we call reflexive. It, it was something he did to himself. The coma patient, on the other hand, was given strength. They received strength from another. That's passive. The other actions that we're looking at, the other aspects of this vision in 1 Corinthians 16, they're active or reflexive. Think about watching. That's active. We're watching out for pitfalls. We're watching out for enemies and for obstacles. We're being careful. That's active. When it comes to standing fast, that's active. We're standing fast against the pressures of the world that want to make us conform to this wicked world that we live in. So we actively resist that. We stand fast against those things. We exercise ourselves towards greater spiritual maturity so that we can grow and, and quit ourselves like men, as it says in 1 Corinthians 16, to become spiritual adults. That's the reflexive. That's something that we take care of to ourselves. But we allow ourselves to be made strong. We aren't the ones doing the action. It's done to us. But that goes against our natural tendencies. People love to think that they've contributed in some way to their own success. You think of the Oscars or the Golden Globes, these awards for actors and so on and, and others involved in the movie industry, and the recipient will get up, they'll receive the award, they'll thank their agent, their co-stars, the director, their family, and so on. But later on, I'm the Oscar winner. I'm the Golden Globe winner. Jim Carrey in his own unique style, said, I don't dream like other people who dream of winning a Golden Globe. I'm Jim Carrey, two-time Golden Globe winner, and I dream, when I dream, I dream that I, that I am Jim Carrey, three-time Golden Globe winner. That's the kind of thinking that people have. They are the ones who achieve the success. 
And that can seep into our lives as well. We want to have some kind of input into our success, but if we do, we don't give the glory to God. It's fascinating to me when we have the friendship bar, the men's breakfast, for example, and there's usually someone who wants to know how they can square us up for the meal. And it's very kind of them. And we try to tell them that there's no charge. We're not doing this for a price. We try to we try to do this for the Lord. These are services we provide in the hope that some sinner will hear the gospel and that they'll be saved. But some still insist on putting money into the box because there's something within us that wants to, that doesn't want to receive something for nothing. We want to have some kind of input into it. But even when it comes to the most important issues of life, our salvation, this is one of the biggest obstacles that people have. They want to have had some role to play. They, they, want, they want to have something that they can point to and say, I did that. God did all of this, but I did that. They just can't accept there's nothing they can provide that God needs. God doesn't need anything from us. We have nothing to give that He hasn't already given us. And if He didn't give it to us, we never had it. And when it comes to salvation, there's nothing in us that God needs for salvation to be available. Jesus did it all. He paid the price in full. All we need to do is receive it with no input on our part. And what's true for salvation is also true for spiritual strength. All we need to do is receive it. But like salvation, we first have to admit that we need it. We need to humble ourselves to ask for it. As Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong. And when we admit that we're weak and helpless, then God can give us His strength. And He can make us stronger than any army, any government, any other earthly power. As a church, we need God's power and strength. We can do nothing without it. Five college students visited London one Sunday to hear Charles Spurgeon preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. They had heard of him, but they had never seen him before. They arrived early at the church, and they were met by a kind gentleman who offered to give them a tour. And at one point, he asked them if they wanted to see the power room of the church down in the basement. And it was a hot July, and they expected this power room to be a hot and sweaty kind of a place. So they weren't too keen, but to be courteous, they agreed. Their guide opened the door, and in the basement there were several hundred people praying fervently and sincerely for the service that was about to take place. And then their guide introduced himself. It was Charles Spurgeon. And he told the young man that without prayer, there's no power. The prayer room is the power room of the church. Why? Because that's the place where God's people humble themselves. That's where they come before God and cry out to Him for His strength and His power to be seen in the meetings because we don't have it ourselves. And what's true for a church is true for every individual. And it's our prayer as a church that God may help us to humble ourselves before Him so that we might be strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man and so do great things for God. May God help us to be those people. Amen. We're going to sing in closing um, just a couple of verses, please. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Thank you to Evelyn for picking these hymns. They fit in so well with what we're thinking of this morning. We'll sing verses uh, 1, 2, and the last, please. 1, 2, and the last of uh, I hear the Savior say.
Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the power of Thy great might that has saved us. We thank Thee for Thy great power that keeps us. We thank Thee, Father, for Thy great power that is our available portion day by day. And Father, we pray that we would be a people that would be humble before Thee, recognizing that without Thee we can do nothing, but that we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Heavenly Father, help us to rely on Thy power day by day. And so be strong in the Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us as we remember our Savior this morning. We pray that this moment will be precious. But for those who do, who do leave, Lord, we pray that your blessing will be upon them. We ask it in our Savior's name. Amen.